Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I'm really excited to be here. This is my first JuliaCon, and it's also my uh, first talk. So uh, hopefully you guys will forgive me if I stumble. Um, if you'd like to follow along in the slides, you can go to my GitHub at KaiMichael and um, grab them from there. There are instructions on how to uh, open them. Um, so I work at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York as a senior research analyst on the DSGE team. Uh, and I'll explain what that acronym means in a couple seconds. And uh, before I begin, I just want to say a special thank you to Ed Herbst and Frank Schorfeide uh, for providing some slide content from a previous workshop that they did on one of these methods. So uh, I will be providing the standard disclaimer. Uh, this talk does not reflect uh, the experience. This talk does not uh, reflect a endorsement by the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Um, all the views expressed are my own and any errors or omissions are also my own. <laughs> so, sorry? No trading. <laughs> no, 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 non-material. Um, so as an outline, I'll be talking generally about state space models and a package that we've been working on at the Fed called state space routines. Um, I'll then proceed to talk about a particular kind of particle filtering method that we've recently implemented called the tempered particle filter. And then I will proceed to highlight some computational details and conclude. So a bit of background. A dynamic stochastic general equilibrium model, or a DSGE model for short, is a macroeconomic model which is built on microeconomic foundations. And it's used to forecast macroeconomic variables and to produce various kinds of policy exercises. But most importantly for this talk, and the reason why I'm even talking about state-space models, is that DSGE models can be represented as state-space models. Um, so if you're curious about the main package that our team develops, uh, DSGE.jl, um, there have been previous talks given by uh, previous research analysts at the Fed, uh, my former colleagues Pearl Lee and Erica Moskowski, who talk about uh, the package and about uh, parallelizing our forecasting step. Um, and for those of you that are interested in actually using it, uh, please do feel free to check out the GitHub page. Feel free to talk to me afterwards. I'd love to uh, field any questions or help. So statespaceroutines.jl contains a variety of filtering and smoothing methods uh, for estimating state space models. And these include the standard Kalman filter for linear state space models and the new tempered particle filter, which I'll be talking more about. We also include various smoothing algorithms, including the Hamilton smoother, uh, the durbin koopman smoother, and uh, a few others, um, which you can go see. But before we dive into all of that, let's, let's address this question for those of you that are not familiar with state-space models. So what is a state-space model? A state-space model is a way to track the dynamic behavior of a set of unobserved variables by using noisy measurements. And so this is a very intuitive kind of design for a model. I think one way you can think about it is kind of in this example right here. Um, if you're trying to track the position of an unmanned rover on Mars, um, and you're trying to understand kind of where it is at any given point in time, but the only way that you can kind of go about knowing this kind of information is by kind of measuring signals that you'll receive periodically that are subject to noise. And so because you kind of understand the programming of this rover, assuming that you've built it, and because you can receive these signals, you can begin to deduce essentially what this unobserved variable is, essentially the true position of this uh, rover on uh, Mars' surface. Um, for those of you that have heard the term hidden Markov model, uh, state space models are conceptually precisely a hidden Markov model. So how is a state space model represented? A general state space model is written by this very simple uh, system of two equations, the first of which we're going to call the transition equation. And it defines a mapping between the previous location of a state variable to its current location, subject to kind of perturba uh, perturbations epsilon that are distributed by some distribution. The next equation is the measurement equation, which is a mapping from this set of unobserved states to things that we do observe. Um, and this is subject to uh, measurement error, as I illustrated in the earlier example. Um, which is distributed to some other distribution, f of u. So some examples of what kind of states, observables, shocks, all these things are uh, within our context at the New York Fed uh, is illustrated in the table below. 
uh, you'll see states are kind of internally represented in the, say, New York Fed DSG model as output growth or inflation. Um, observables are the actual data that we use to kind of discipline the model. So you'll have these series such as the real, uh, real GDP growth or core PC inflation. You'll have kind of fundamental structural shocks that perturb uh, these state uh, variables at any given point T, such as a productivity shock. And we have time invariant parameters that we're trying to estimate, um, such as the household discount rate. So one question to address, given that this talk is entitled Estimating Nonlinear Models, is why do we care about nonlinear models? I think probably for most of you from other fields, especially in kind of the hard sciences where I'd, I would say your dynamical systems are much larger and potentially more complicated, um, it's almost a no-brainer that you should be working with some sort of nonlinear model because linear approximations are bad. Um, but by and large, in uh, economics, as it currently stands, within specifically the discipline of working with DSG models, um, we tend to work with linear approximations just because they're more tractable. Um, but it's true that most linear models are linear approximations of some true nonlinear model. And sometimes these nonlinearities in models are actually fundamental to explaining their behavior. So if you linearize, you lose all of the interesting kind of information that is provided to you by the nonlinearities. And so some examples of nonlinear models are models in economics that incorporate the zero lower bound constraints on the nominal interest rate. Uh, in finance, there are stochastic volatility models, uh, but also in kind of other fields of which I'm no expert in, such as fluid dynamics and environmental science, you have kind of other kinds of models like turbulent flow models or kind of ecological prediction models that have interesting nonlinearities and can be modeled as a state-based model and moreover have been traditionally estimated with different kinds of particle filters. So I, before I even move into there, um, I guess we'll kind of, for, for those of you that are unfamiliar with, uh, with particle filters, I'll be contrasting tempered particle filter with the standard bootstrap particle filter to kind of explain what exactly the novel contribution is of the tempered particle filter when it comes to performance. Um, so as I discussed earlier, this state variable, from our perspective, is unknown. We're uncertain about its exact value. And so one other way that you could characterize it, and this is a nice little anecdote that was taught to me in a class I took as an undergrad uh, at NYU uh, by a former professor of mine and also, I guess, a former keynote speaker at uh, Julia, Tom Sargent, uh, who said, a model is really simple. It's just a probability distribution over a set of states. And so in a standard state space where you have linear transition equations and uh, measurement equations, it's actually pretty easy because the state is just distributed normally. So it's sufficient to just have the mean and the variance to be able to track the distribution of the state at, an, at any given point in time. And this is really actually the primary characteristic of why the Kalman filter is so nice, is the Kalman filter has a closed form recursion for calculating essentially those two uh, moments of the state distribution. But for nonlinear and non-Gaussian models, you don't have that. It's just, it's not that simple. And so that's why particle filter method, uh, methods were developed, essentially to provide a Monte Carlo approximation to the distribution, which could be any general shape. So now that we've established that background, let's dive right into the tempered particle filter. Um, it was introduced by a paper, Tempered Particle Filtering, uh, by Ed Herbst and Frank Schorfeide, uh, to uh, co-authors and also uh, colleagues of ours at the New York Fed. And it's going to be published in an upcoming edition of the Journal of Econometrics. If you're interested in actually reading the paper and understanding more of the mathematical details, you can find it at the link in the slides. Here's the algorithm. It's pretty straightforward. And it's written in this way such that for those of you that are familiar with the bootstrap filter, you'll see that it's actually a special case of the tempered particle filter. So, the first step is the initialization step, where you draw capital N particles, S naught, from some initial distribution, and you initialize capital N weights, W naught, each to be one. <coughs> then you enter into the recursion, and for each time step T, you forecast the states where you think they're gonna be with the transition equation. You correct them by calculating the weights of each particle, and then you use the selection step, which resamples the particles, and this last step right here, the sequential Monte Carlo sampler, is essentially kind of the key 
uh, ingredient that tempered particle filter introduces into this particle filtering method um, that actually contains the correction and selection step kind of aforementioned. Um, and so for those of you that might not be so certain about what all of these things mean intuitively, um, perhaps this illustration will help you. So this is a really nice, actually, genetic interpretation of what exactly sequential Monte Carlo is doing. And so I'm going to use the analogy of kind of talking about a herd of giraffes as being the stand-in for our swarm of particles. So you initialize the particles according to some distribution. In this case, you just start off with these three nice-looking giraffes. Um, in the correction step, what you should see here in the genetic distribution is that I'm resizing these giraffes. Essentially, in the correction step, you're determining the quote-unquote fitness of each individual particle um, with respect to one another. And so, in this case, the bottom giraffe is just much more fit than the top two. Um, in the selection step, you can think of it as kind of culling the herd. Only the fittest get to survive and reproduce children. And so in this case, in the selection step, kind of the middle giraffe was not very fit, and so it didn't get to propagate to the next kind of it, uh, generation of giraffes, and this kind of bottom giraffe uh, had a child. Um, and in this final step of mutation, you can think of it as an evolution step, as in each of these giraffes are becoming more adapted to the environment that they're living in. Um, and so the, the two kind of aspects of quote unquote fitness that we care about are fitness on the individual level, as in how do we determine basically the fitness of a particular particle, and how do we determine the quote unquote fitness of a particular herd. And so uh, because SMC uh, can be characterized as being a very egalitarian algorithm, you want all of your particles to be equally fit. Um, and so for those of you that are not satisfied with this heuristic um, definition of uh, fitness, uh, let me actually ground it in some uh, of the mathematical foundation. And so essentially what this can be characterized as is uh, an important sampling scheme uh, where the fitness of an individual particle is denoted by its important sampling weight. Essentially, if you take F to be the true population of, uh, sorry, true distribution of the states, G1 and G2 are kind of proposed distributions of the states. Um, and we care about kind of how good our proposal fits the true distribution. So you'll see G1 is a pretty good approximation of F, and so all of the weights, which are calculated just by the ratio of the densities, are actually pretty uniform, which is good. Um, but for G2, because it's a really bad proposal for the uh, true distribution, its weights are very dispersed. And the reason why we care about this is you can think about kind of the reason why we care about even establishing a proposal distribution from the point of view of computing a sample mean with respect to this Monte Carlo simulation, right? If we care about computing this expectation under pi of this function h of, in this case, it's our parameters. Uh, sorry, this is kind of a notational thing. Uh, anyway, um, then you can think of this concept of an effective sample size as essentially being what's kind of the equivalent calculation of kind of the number of draws that I can take from the true distribution to kind of be as accurate as the number of draws that I would take from this proposed distribution. And so with that being established, I'm going to move on to talking about the weaknesses of the bootstrap. And so the two primary characteristics of the bootstrap that kind of give it difficulties is that there are a lack of diversity in particle values that lead to a less accurate Monte Carlo approximation. Think about the sample mean calculation that I talked about earlier. And this is also primarily due to the aspect that it has an inability to adapt to periods in which highly unlikely data is realized. So if you look at this set of distributions in the previous slides, or if you'll imagine it with me, if we're in 2008 and we realize Q4 data, which is the first quarter of the recession, um, this is highly unlikely from the perspective of the model, right? And so what's gonna happen is this proposed distribution is gonna be way off of the true distribution, right? And because of that, you're gonna have this huge imbalance in the number of weights. And when you resample, according to some standard resampling scheme like multinomial resampling, you'll end up with very few kind of support weights where there are particles. And so one way that we can address this, and this is the key inside of the tempered particle filter, is that 
holding all else constant, if you increase the measurement error variance, this decreases the variance of the particle weights. You could think about it as if you distrust your model and you say that you know, most of the variation in the data we're seeing is due to measurement error, then essentially everything is kind of equally likely, right? And so what you can do, um, yeah, and then here's a particular functional form of the weights uh, if your measurement error is normally distributed. So we could think about this is if you kind of walk along this phi of n axis, essentially what you're doing is you're tempered, quote unquote tempered, or increased the measurement error artificially, such that your particles are relatively diffuse and the weights are relatively even. And utilizing this kind of sequential Monte Carlo algorithm where the mutation step uh, mathematically is just a series of metropolis hasting steps, is that the particles migrate essentially as you temper down the measurement error variance towards the true distribution of the states with respect to the data at a given time t. And so empirically what this means is that in this example where we look at the predictive density, the probability of yt, the data at time t, with respect to all the previous data that we've seen, um, this example is from a small uh, New Keynesian model, um, is that in these periods where essentially, you know, we realize highly unlikely data, these are recession periods, you'll see that and one other thing to point out is n equals 1,000 or n equals blank is the number of particles in that simulation. So you'll see the bootstrap particle filter, which is this light blue line, always performs poorly during all of these downward spikes, even up to 15,000 particles in the simulation, whereas the tempered particle filter actually does extremely well. You'll see that it fits uh, the Kalman filter um, as a benchmark pretty tightly. Um, and in this case, that's what we want, right? Because this model, which maybe I've, I omitted, is this model is linear. So the Kalman filter should be the benchmark, I think, for performance um, here. And so that's kind of some of our preliminary results. We're still working on our tempered particle filter and improving it. And so as I go on to talk about some computational details and as we enter into the question and answers, um, I'll definitely appreciate uh, any sort of feedback or advice. Um, so I guess a brief note on parallel computing and macroeconomics. Uh, the summary of these slides is essentially, in macroeconomics, you're hoping to capture a lot of kind of the rich complexities of kind of the dynamic behavior of various macroeconomic variables in the economy. And so naturally, as we begin to make these models more complicated, we need to be able to develop better methods for estimating them, uh, tractable methods for estimating them. Um, and one nice characteristic of a lot of these new methods, such as the tempered particle filter, and the sequential Monte Carlo uh, algorithm for posterior sampling um, is that they're parallelizable. Um, whereas standard MCMC methods are inherently serial, such as the random walk metropolis Hastings algorithm, which we generally use to sample from the posterior distribution of the parameters for a model, um, you know, they, they aren't able to be parallelized. Whereas uh, SMC methods are inherently parallel because each particle can be thought of essentially as its own Markov chain. And hence, its evolution can be simulated largely independent from the paths of the other particles. <coughs> so some things to think about as you're thinking about kind of computing your own, uh, implementing your own parallel algorithms, um, is that the size of the computation being parallelized over matters a lot, uh, especially in proportion to the overall size of the algorithm. Um, and another thing that's kind of related to this uh, is the relevant share of time computing, uh, Relative share of time spent conducting network I.O. versus actually computing is also a concern because specifically for TPF, it's actually a pretty lightweight algorithm. Um, all in all, for kind of the parameter specifications that we care about, it takes on the order of like a second or two to calculate. Um, and so because we're parallelizing over the most, like really the most kind of computationally intensive single calculation in TPF is really just a matrix vector product. Um, a lot of time can be spent essentially sending this data and retrieving this data that can overwhelm the speed gains uh, from parallel implementation. And so, as you can see here, these are kind of different variants of TPF that uh, we've run and we've worked with uh, in the past. Um, I've been told that this notation for delineating different kinds of parallel uh, implementations is a little bit unclear, and so the distributed parallel, what I mean by distributed is distributed across a cluster, so across multiple machines. Um, whereas the shared memory parallel is just distributed along cores in the same machine. Um, and so, and serial is just serial. And so if you see, 
essentially, with a very small population of particles, the serial execution is fast or faster than the parallel Im implementations and only really after 4,000 particles or more do we see uh, our parallel implementation actually beat the serial implementation. Um, and so this was a relatively kind of recent thing that we discovered um, with some help from our friends at Julia Computing uh, in providing some advice about how to think properly about parallelization, but I think there's definitely still work to be done. Um, this is the bottom line. The Fortran code that implements TPF uh, is still faster by 10 times. Um, this is not great. Uh, it's better than what we were facing in the past, um, but realistically, by being a filtering method, this is essentially the key computational component of a sampling scheme for DSG models, and so if our filter's slow, the sampling's gonna be slow. And so we definitely want to be able to kind of think about and potentially solicit advice as to kind of ways that we can improve thinking about our implementation. Um, so uh, that's essentially it. Um, I know it was pretty brief, and so I'm more than willing to answer questions about the algorithm itself. Um, but uh, just to highlight some ongoing work, so we're continuing to work on the tempered particle filter and the state space routines package, which we hope uh, all of you guys who work with state space models will find useful. Um, also, uh, we're working on sequential Monte Carlo sampling in DSG.jl, which I mentioned earlier. Um, the tagline is it's a parallelized and robust alternative to random walk metropolis hastings, or, uh, and it's used to sample from the posterior distribution of the parameters. Um, two ways that these tools can potentially be useful in kind of determining the future of what our work looks like at the New York Fed uh, is in the heterogeneous agent DSG models that we're beginning to estimate. Um, essentially, the relevant point to mention about heterogeneous agent models uh, is that the computational tractability of these models is order of magnitudes kind of more difficult to work with. Uh, and so we kind of need these tools essentially to uh, be able to feasibly estimate these models. So we've currently implemented in discrete and continuous time uh, implementations of the Crusoe-Smith uh, model, which is a fairly simple uh, heterogeneous agent DSG model. And we've implemented a continuous time implementation of the one asset Hank model. Um, if you're familiar with the economics literature, it's in kind of the same flavor as a uh, upcoming paper in the uh, AER. I believe it's yet to be published, but I may be wrong, by uh, Ben Mole et al. Uh, and a few other co-authors at Princeton. Um, and so for some acknowledgments, um, I'd like to thank the uh, New York Fed DSGU team, Marco Del Negro, uh, my boss, uh, and Ethan Matlin and Rika Serfati, uh, my fellow DSG uh, research analysts. And also, uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, our DSG alums, Pearl Lee, a uh, former JulieCon speaker, and Abhi Gupta, uh, good luck in graduate school. Um, very, very uh, proud of you guys. And that is essentially it. Thank you so much. So to speak more about the model that I showed some benchmarks with respect to the common filter on. Um, so I don't know if three-dimensional is the best way to, to characterize it. It's uh, just a three, I guess you could, you could talk about it that way, but um, it's essentially just three simple equations. It's the uh, IS equation, it's the uh, Euler equation, and it's the uh, New Keynesian Phillips curve. Um, and it's, it's, it's really actually, I think, the most granular distillation of what the core kind of components of a DSG model are. Um, in terms of what that means practically for this kind of estimation method or for estimation methods broadly speaking, um, I guess the number of, yeah, I guess that is a way to think about it, the, the dimensionality. So those equations determine the number of states in the system that we're estimating, so uh, yes, so three states. Um, and, and that's considered fairly small. Our New York Fed DSG model is something on the order of uh, Oh boy, I should know this. It's around maybe 80 states or so, uh, 80 or 90 states, and they're about like a similar neighborhood of the number of parameters that we're estimating in the model. Um, 
In terms of the random number generation, I'm actually not really privy to knowing kind of whether or not it's better to a priori just generate all the random numbers and read them into the various parallelized processes, which is I think actually how the Fortran code is implemented. I maybe just naively assume that the random number generator works kind of the same on master and worker processes in terms of the time spent or even that it would be kind of more expedient to just generate the random numbers on each process given that you wouldn't have to generate them all at once. So. Um, it should be. So, yeah. So, I mean, if you actually look at the package, there's this glaring build failing button uh, in the readme. Um, and the reason for it actually is something that we haven't gotten around to dealing with. So, when it actually uh, kind of sends out the commit to Travis CI to essentially run the builds and check uh, all the tests, um, there's a build failure on the HDF5 package that I've kind of yet to figure out why this is happening. So, like, if you're willing to take my word for it, the tests run, or you can kind of check this for yourself and. Uh, obviously, you can submit issues if you come across problems, but by and large, uh, our experience with uh, that code base is that it's 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 been working relatively well. So, yes, uh, yes, there should be documentation. I think the way that the code reads is almost kind of a literal one for one with the actual papers that are also referenced in the README, um, and the tempered particle filter also has some instructions and an, and an example as well uh, that I've verified. Uh, yesterday night that it runs properly. Uh, yeah, there was a recent refactor of actually a lot of these algorithms in our library to make them a little bit faster, um, which is nice. So yeah, feel free to check it out. Can you tell me more about the parallelism that's in the Fortran model? You said it was 10 times faster. Is that, is it distributed as well, or? So, oh boy, Fortran. Um, I think it uses, is it open MPI like library? Like, and I, I think it's it's distributed on like this. I think on like a single machine, kind of in a shared memory fashion that we're kind of currently trying to do. Uh, but to be honest, I'm not fluent in Fortran, um, and so uh, kind of the actual implementation details of the Fortran code, I uh, I'm afraid I can't kind of uh, elaborate too much on. Thank you. <laughs> 